which is the beginning of FIT 18, which is page 85 in the third edition, um, about line 1192. All right. We left off with wealthy all coming forth and making some comments to Kravulf, or wealth or Kravdar. Kind of Kravulf is implied in them. She uses his name and such. And I talked about how I read those lines sarcastically. Right? Then we get fit 18. Big wine goblet, or mead goblet, is brought forth. And we're told, a friendly greeting conveyed with words and wound gold offered with goodwill. Two armlets, garments and rings, etc. Okay? These are things that Wealthyal is bringing to Beowulf. Okay? In the greatest neck collar ever heard of anywhere on earth. Under heaven, I have not heard tell of a better hoard treasure of heroes since Hama carried off to the bright city the Brazinga necklace, the gem and its treasures. He fled the treachery of Ermenric, chose eternal counsel. And you've got a little gloss down there about the bottom. Okay? Nothing's known much of Hama. Tolkien uses the name in the Lord of the Rings, okay? who stole the necklace from Ermenric. Okay? And we're told it's the brazing a necklace. We don't really even know what that means. It's the necklace that belonged to the brazings. Okay? But what the poet is saying is that this is the greatest necklace that's ever been created. By necklace, it's probably meant a torque of some sort. Okay? Either a single flattened piece of gold or wound gold. And the implication here because of the comment about wound gold offered with goodwill, that this is a torque made out of several, several strands of gold wire woven um, together, almost braided together. Okay? You go to the British Museum, you can see all kinds of examples of this. Get on the internet and look for um, gold torque, T-O-R-C, and you'll see quite a few of them. Okay? So... The poet then jumps right into the first of what's called um, references to Helix Frisian raids. This is the first reference to Helix Frisian raid. There's going to be three of them. The poet does these because in this instance, he's jumping forward in time. It hasn't occurred yet. All right. The other two times that it's mentioned, he's looking back in time. Take that back. This one is looking back in time. This one is also, the second one is also looking forward in time. Right? So the poet immediately launches into. He elect the gate on his last journey, had that neck ring, that is, had the necklace that was given to Beowulf. When under the banner he defended his booty, the spoils of slaughter. Fate struck him down when in his pride he went looking for woe, a feud with the Frisians. Notice, we're told, he went looking. He is starting a feud. Right? He attacks the Frisians without there being anything to prompt the attack. His name, by the way, Hilak or Hijalak, means mind or thought. That's the Hija part. Lack. Lack thought, lack mind, lack smarts. Okay? Could be that he's kind of named this because of what he does. Bear in mind, though, Helek is a is probably an historical character. He really lived. So he wore that finery, that is that necklace, those precious stones over the cup of the sea, that powerful lord, and collapsed under a shield. Into Frankish hands came the life of that king. His breast garments and the great collar too. A lesser warrior looted the corpses, mowed down in battle. Gatish men held that killing field. Right? Gatish men held that killing field is a little bit ambiguous because it sounds like they ruled. They won the battle. But they didn't. All were slaughtered save one. All those men who went with Helak on this raid died, except for one. So probably by saying they held that field means 
they occupied, they became the occupants of the field. They all died, okay? Again, except for one, Beowulf. Beowulf alone escapes. We're not told that in this passage, we're going to be told that, I believe it is in this passage. It's either this one or this one, okay? We find out later on, Beowulf swims away, literally swims, right? Away from that battle with the coats of mail of 30 men on his arm. And one modern scholar has suggested that he's not actually swimming. He's in a boat and he's rowing. Right? Why? Because anybody could do that. You, anybody could put 30 coats of mail into a boat and row. And what the scholar is doing is he's kind of trying to remove the marvelous elements of Beowulf. Okay, to demythologize Beowulf, so to speak. I don't think that's possible. I think you take the mythology, take the marvel out of Beowulf, and you end up with just, you know, Joe Schmo. He's, he's nothing special. So, the hall swallowed the noise. That is, the noise of revelry. Keep in mind, what are they doing? Why? Go ahead, why? Because Beowulf. Because Beowulf was victorious, Grindel's dead. They're celebrating, okay? So, Welthiau, the poet says, and, and notice how he does this. The poet makes reference to the, the necklace that Welthiau is going to give him, give Beowulf. And then the poet jumps way up into the future and says, what is going to happen to that necklace? Okay. It's going to get lost when Helak carries it off in the fishing raid. His body is plundered, and everything on him is taken. Kind of interesting to ask at that point. Where is Beowulf? Why isn't Beowulf stopping Helak's body from being plundered? Okay, Because, you know, fourfold ethic. If your king dies, you're supposed to die with him in battle. Unless you can kill everybody. Okay, so Beowulf does eventually kill the Frisians so that he's the last man standing. But he should stop them from plundering his Lord's body. But be that as it may. Jumps to the future, tells, gives us kind of enigmatically this little story, and then comes back to the present. Because what's happening back in the present? Meanwhile, Welthiau is still giving Beowulf these rewards. And she, sh she says this while giving him the necklace. Beowulf, beloved warrior, wear this neck ring in good health and enjoy this war garment, treasure of a people, and prosper well. Be bold and clever. And then she addresses specifically, remember the, the setting. We've got the hall. Okay, Beowulf is sitting here, Hrethric on one side, Hrothmund on the other side, Hrothgar across, Unferth at his feet, Hrothulf on one side, and Wealthy is just kind of hovering, you know, in the area. And so now she's not addressing Hrothulf. In her previous speech, she was. She says, you know, I really trust that my good Hrothulf, if he remembers the kindnesses we've done to him, he will treat our sons well, okay? Now she addresses Beowulf. Be bold and clever, and to these boys, be mild in counsel. Notice she calls her sons boys, implying what? Okay, what else? They're youth. They're still young. Okay. When Beowulf arrived, he said, I'm young. But then he said, in my youth, I slaughtered all these monsters and stuff. So, is it, you know, is this the mentality, age is merely a state of mind, and Beowulf's really 50, and yet he's talking about in his youth? Beowulf's age really intrigues me, okay? So, be mild in counsel to these boys. I will remember you for that. You have made it so that men will praise you far and near, forever and ever, 
we're still reading about them, right? As wide as the seas, home of the winds, surround the shores of earth. Be while you live, blessed, O nobleman. She's saying, may you be blessed. I wish you well with these bright treasures. And she kind of says, you know, bring them forth. Be to my sons kind in your deeds, keeping them in joys. Okay, so now twice she has said, be something to my sons. Be mild in counsel. What does that mean? Yeah, be like an advisor. Give them good advice. Okay? She's not saying, you know, incite them to violence. Okay? But then she says, be kind in your deeds. That's not words. That's action. Okay? Keeping them in joys. What's she actually asking him to do? Keep them joyful. How? Keep them in power. Keep them, just keep them, <laughs> maintain their lives. Here, each earl is true to the other, mild in his heart, loyal to his liege lord, the thanes united, the nation alert, the troop, having drunk at my table, will do as I bid. The way a lot of scholars read that, especially that last line, is here in the land of the Danes, these men are loyal to me. They will do as I bid, and that she is thus insinuating, because you are drinking at my table, you also should do as I bid. That's one way to read it. Okay? Another way to read it is when she says here, each earl is true to the other. She might be kind of nodding and winking at Beowulf, kind of going, keep an eye on him. Watch Rodolf. Yeah, everybody's friends here. It's like members of Congress from the right side and the left side say, my esteemed colleague, because they can't say that sorry sack of, you know what, on the floor of Congress. Why? Because they'll be held in contempt of Congress if they do that. I mean, there are actual rules of Congress about things you may not say on the floor of the Senate or the House. Okay? So, she makes her speech. She goes and sits. The men drink and did not know weird. What is weird again? That which will be. In other words, they don't know what's coming. The cruel fate which would come to pass for many an earl once evening came. How many an earl did cruel fate come to pass for in this next evening? It's just one. Only one guy dies. How many died the night before? Only one. How many died the night before that? We're not quite sure. See, this is where the poem's a little bit ambiguous. Because at one point, it's going to suggest, Hrothgar is actually going to suggest, that every night of those 12 years that Grindel held Herod, he ate 30 men. Every night. You do the math. And we're told, Hrothgar has a large troop. Yeah, really large if he can essentially sacrifice 30 men a night for 12 years. Okay? So, and Hrothgar departed to his own dwelling, the mighty one to his rest. Notice we're not told he's seeking out his wife's bed. Countless men held that hall, as they often had before. They cleared away bench planks, spread cushions, bedding on the floor. One of those beer drinkers lay down his head to his rest. What? Fate did. Right for death. They set at their heads their round battle shields, the bright boards, and it's this kind of language, okay, telling us what they do when they go to sleep. It's this kind of language that made early readers of Beowulf, early scholars of Beowulf, read Beowulf as a mine. Okay? 
right, like a gold mine, to be mined for historical information about Germanic customs. I mean, what are we being told here? We've got the hall, and what do they do? They clear away the tables. Why? Because the hall, normally, when it's being occupied, would look like this. You've got a hearth in the middle, and then you've got these tables <clears throat> laid out on either side of the hearth, like that. Okay? They're trestle tables, so they can be taken apart. So they take the tabletop, and they go, and they lean it up against the wall. And then they put the legs and the benches up against the wall and clear out this nice big area so that they can put their sleeping bags essentially down. Okay? What do they do? They put their heads down, and where do they put their shields? Right here. Why? So they can be reached very quickly. Okay? So we're given this custom information about sleeping practices, about gift-giving practices, okay? rather than those early scholars reading it as a work of literary poetry. So, fit 19, they sink into sleep. One paid sorely for his evening's rest. As had often happened, Grindel guarded that gold hall, committed his wrongs until he came to his end, died for his sins. Again, the poet is saying Grindel got what he had coming. The damned sinner, you know. It was soon all too clear, obvious to men, that an avenger still lived on after that enemy. And the poet tells us it's Grindel's mother. Has Grindel's mother been referred to before? No. Okay. So the poet gives us a little bit more background. Tr traces Grindel again back to Cain. And then says, um, line 1269, when the great beast began to seize him, he remembered his mighty strength. That is, when Grindel began to seize Beowulf, Beowulf remembered, oh yeah, I'm Beowulf. <laughs> the ample gifts which God had given him, trusted the Almighty for mercy, and he overcame the fiend. Grindel went away wretched, okay, deprived of joy, to find his place of death. But his mother still wanted to go to do what? To avenge her son's death. What is she doing? Fourfold Germanic ethic. She's following Anglo-Saxon custom and law. He killed my son. Is Beowulf willing to pay where guild? Grindel is called a man at one point. Or is he willing to pay monster guild? Aglaka guild, as the word is used? No, he's not. Okay? So she's going to go exact vengeance. She reaches Herat. She comes in. And we're told, line 1283, the horror was less by as much as a maiden strength. That is, the horror of her arrival is only that much less as is a woman's strength than a man's. Okay? She takes a man and takes him away. Line 1292, she came in haste, meant to hurry out save her life when she was surprised there. But she quickly seized, fast in her clutches, one nobleman, and went to the fence. He was the dearest of heroes to Hrothgar, among his comrades, whom she snatched from his rest. This guy's name is Asher. Spelled variously. And what it, Hera is the word for army. This is Ash, probably implying spear. So he's probably a spearman. But he's an old, trusted counselor and advisor to Hrothgar. They've been in battle a lot together. So we're told, morning comes, and what's discovered? Asher is dead. Okay. Hrothgar's closest. This would be like, let's use modern politics. This would be like if Valerie Jarrett woke woke up dead. 
<laughs> this would be like if Valerie Jar Jarrett was discovered dead in the White House. Or, even better, to follow more closely the analogy, if she was discovered missing from the White House and her head was found four blocks away. Okay? Because that's what they find. They follow the track, they come around a bend, and there's Asherah's head sitting on a ledge. Facing, looking out at them. I mean, she has a mind for presentation here. She, you know, she's arranging this this way. So, Hrothgar has brought news, line 15, uh, 1306. Then the wise old king, gray-bearded warrior, was grieved at heart when he learned that he no longer lived, the second he is Asherah, the dearest of men is chief thane. So, they fetch Beowulf. Why? Where did Beowulf sleep that night? Not in Herod. Okay. He slept somewhere else. Beowulf comes. Went with his men, line 1313, to where the old king waited, wondering whether the Almighty would ever work a change after his tidings of woe. Notice, this is Hrothgar wondering whether the Almighty would ever work a change after his tidings of woe. Didn't he just say seven or eight hours before, take that back, 12 hours before? I never expected to see a change, and Almighty God did it. He is able to produce a mighty work of wonder today, just as he was able to yesterday. And suddenly, what's happened to that mentality on Hrothgar's part? Yeah, out of, out of mind. It's like, we're back in the same old rut, okay? And Beowulf walks in, and he asks Hrothgar, notice, Beowulf may not be very perceptive, okay? Because he walks in, he sees Hrothgar. How has Hrothgar been described so far? Distraught. Distraught, yeah. He's not sitting there cheerful. He doesn't have a happy face on. And Beowulf walks in and goes, Rothgar, old man, how you doing? How'd you sleep last night? <laughs> you feeling good this morning? Rothgar kind of gives him this look. Ask not of joys. Sorrow is renewed for the Danish people. Asherah is dead. My confidant, my counselor, my shoulder companion in every conflict. Now what does he mean by my shoulder companion? Okay. We hear the metaphor used all the time today, especially when something really, really bad goes down. Okay, 9-11, for example. Tony Blair called George Bush and said, we stand shoulder to shoulder, not an inch of daylight between us. What does that really mean? What does the metaphor hearken back to? Okay, Spartan phalanx, Anglo-Saxon shield wall, where Anglo-Saxons would interlock, okay, their arms sometimes, but their shields definitely, so that no matter how hard an opposing army came against them, they couldn't break through because of their arms being interlocked, holding the shield, Okay? And then the other arm holding a spear or sword and jabbing underneath the shields or over the top, etc. Okay? That's what that metaphor of standing shoulder to shoulder means. It means you've got to trust that person beside you never to flinch. Because if they move, if they break the wall, you're dead. Okay? So this is what Asherah was for Hrothgar. In Herod, he was slain by the hand of a restless death spirit. I do not know where that ghoul went, gloating with its carcass, rejoicing in its feast. And then he says, she. Okay, so far it's been it, it. She avenged that feud in which you killed Grendel yesterday evening in your violent way with a crushing vice grip. Notice what he is saying here. Yeah, it's all your fault. You killed her son. You started a feud. 
He fell in battle and cost him his life, and now another has come, a mighty evil marauder who means to avenge her kin, and too far has carried out her revenge. And then he says, 1345, I've heard my countrymen and hall companions talk about two of these grim spirits walking the moors. Don't you think that information might have been useful <laughs> yesterday? <laughs> The second of them, as far as they could discern, that is, they don't go up close and, you know, give her a physical. They said, looked like a woman. The other, misshapen, marched the exile's path in the form of a man, except that he was larger than any other. And in bygone days, that is, in olden days, he was called Grindel, kind of suggesting Grindel and his mother have been around for a while. They knew no father. That is, the local people did not know who Grindel's father was. They, they never saw a third one. Okay? And so he tells us where they live. That murky land they hold, wolf-haunted slopes, windy headlands, awful fin paths, where the upland torrents plunge downward under the dark crags, the flood underground. It's not far from here. He's saying, Beowulf, take that little road, go down about a couple of miles, take a, hang a right, you know, and find the water with the sea monsters in it. That's their home. It's not far hence, measured in miles, that the mere stands. And he gives us a description of it. Over it hangs a grove, hoar frosted. So he's saying, here's the lake. Okay. On one side of it, there's kind of a cliff. On top of the cliff, are trees, and the trees are hoar-frosted. That is, it's like they're always covered in ice. Okay? Every night one can see there an awesome wonder, fire on the water. That is, and if you go to the lake at night, there's flames on the water. Not an ordinary lake, in other words. There lives none so wise or bold that he can fathom its abyss. Though the heath stepper be set by hounds, the strong horned heart might seek the forest. He will sooner lose his life on the shore than save his head and go in the lake. That is, a deer being pursued by hounds will sooner face the hounds than jump in the water. Okay. There's waves. It's windy. Now, once again, all help depends on you alone. You do not yet know this fearful place where you might find the sinful creature. Seek it if you dare. I dare you, Beowulf. He almost, you know, I double dare you. I will reward you with ancient riches for that feud as I did before. If you return alive. Okay. What does he already know about Beowulf? Okay, one, he killed Grindel. What else? Okay, he's proud. If he is young, what tends to happen if you dare a cocky young warrior? He's gonna do it. Yeah. All right. All right, I'll do it. I'll see that, you know. Beowulf. Sorrow not, wise man. It's always better to avenge one's friend than to mourn over much. What does Beowulf say in response? What does that sorrow not? It's always better to avenge one's friend than to mourn over much. <laughs> yeah, what you, yeah, that's really what he's saying. We're take care of it. He's saying, suck it up, old man. Come on, get up. Each of us must await the end of this world's life. Meaning, we all die. Everybody dies. Let him who can bring about fame before death. That is best for the unliving man after he is gone. We're all going to die. Do something to earn fame and glory. What do we know about Asherah? He earned fame and glory, at least in Hrothgar's mind. So what's Beowulf saying? 
get up, strap on a sword, let's go kill some monster, you know. So, he says, let's go. I promise you this. He will find no protection, not in the belly of the earth or the bottom of the sea or the mountain groves. Let him go where he will. It's almost like he's channeling, you know, Winston Churchill, 1,500 years before Winston Churchill. We will fight him on the beaches. We'll fight him in the headlands. We'll fight him in the forest. We'll fight him. I'll fight him where? You know, in the sea, in the mountain groves, in the belly of the earth. Today you must endure patiently all your woes, as I expect you will. What does he mean by endure patiently? Especially the patiently part. Okay, what else though? I mean, why do they say, sorrow not and don't mourn over much? Okay, what is mourning? What kind of grief, though? It's a wailing kind. That is, it is an expression of grief. What's Beowulf really saying? Suck it up and bottle it up. Put a cork in it, Hrothgar. That's what he's saying. That's what the wanderer said. That's what the seafarer said. A wise nobleman does what? Binds up his breast hoard. He locks it all up, throws away the key. He doesn't speak about it. That's what Beowulf means. Come on, suck it up and endure it, which means don't talk about it. You just, you go on, okay? The old man leapt up. Thank the Lord. Praise Jesus. You know. <laughs> the mighty God for that man's speech. It worked. Beowulf's speech, you know, does what? Puts a spine in his back. Seemingly. So, they go off to Grindel's Mere. Grindel's Mere, by the way, the description of it, as having the fire on the lake, the cliffs, the trees above, exactly matches a description of of another place given in two separate texts, two other texts in addition to Beowulf. Right? One is called the Vision of St. Paul, um, and the other one is a homily. Right? And what all three describe, if we take what this place is described as in the homily and the Vision of St. Paul, is the entrance to hell. We're not sure which of these three texts comes first? Because it's pretty clear okay, that the image is being borrowed. We don't know if Beowulf's borrowing it from the vision of St. Paul, or is borrowing it from the Blickling Homily 17, or if Blickling Homily gets it from Beowulf, whatever. But it's the same description in all three. Okay? And in those other two texts, it's described as the entrance to hell. So, they go off. They find Grindel's mirror. Okay. Men right ahead. They see, you know, Asher's head sticking out there. And we're told, line 1441, Beowulf geared up in his warrior's clothing. Why? Has he been riding naked until this point? I mean, if you go by the stupid movie, you would assume that's kind of what that must mean. <laughs> no! any of the stupid movies. There's never been a decent Beowulf made. I have no idea why. It's written to be made into a film, it seems to me at least. Right? No, what's this mean? Yeah. Unlike the fight against Grindel, this time he's arming up. He's arming to the teeth. He's going to become Iron Man, essentially, for this battle. Okay? He cared not for his life. The broad war shirt woven by hand, cunningly mane, had to test the mirror. It knew well how to protect his bone house. So we get the mail shirt, we get the helmet, okay? And then we're told, line 1455, Hrothgar's spokesman loans him something. Okay, who's Hrothgar's spokesman again? Unferth. What does he loan him? A sword. 
named Hrunting, which essentially means son of Hrunt. You don't know what Hrunt means, okay? It's a powerful weapon, unique among ancient sword or ancient treasures. Its edge was iron, etched with poison stripes. It doesn't literally mean it's got poison dripping on the edge. This is talking about how the sword was actually made. This is what's called a pattern welded sword. Okay? It's not a sword made out of a single piece of steel or iron. This is a sword made out of multiple rods of iron that are heated and beat, heated and beat, heated and beat until the multiple rods are beat into a single piece of iron. And then, I mean, do a Google search and you can see the imagery. And then what you see once the blade is all finished is you have this nice shiny blade and it has what look like stripes going up and down it. Okay? This is the most valuable kind of sword there was. Some of these have been discovered. In fact, just, just last week, I don't know that this one is actually a pattern welded sword. In fact, last week, two discoveries were announced. These guys were hiking in Norway. Just hike, walking along, hiking, and they see on the ground a sword. This sword is 1,200 years old. It's just laying there. <laughs> like, you know, Sven, Viking son, was walking one day and his sword dropped. And he just kept, you know, walking on along. Okay? That happened. And then uh, in Iceland, these three guys were out goose hunting and they come across a thousand year sword just laying on the ground. Okay? Both of them Viking swords. Kind of cool. The one in Norway that was discovered, uh, if I remember right, belongs to the three guys who found it. I think they gave it to Norway. The one in Iceland belongs to Iceland. Anything found in Iceland automatically belongs to the government. Don't know that I'd like that government, but you know, there it is. So, Unferth gives them hunting. And notice, Beowulf accepts hunting with great flowing, beautiful, kind, generous words, okay? Would you really want Unferth's sword? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know, but, you know, Beowulf said you killed your brother. How'd he kill his brother? Did he break his neck? Did he stab his guts out? And if he did, what does that mean? That this sword was a kinslayer sword. And who's Beowulf going to kill? Yeah, who descends from Cain, chief of kinslayers. Kind of like, you know, using something against somebody that probably wouldn't work against them. Okay? Anyways, so Beowulf speaks. Notice, Beowulf likes to speak a lot. He likes to give speeches. <laughs> 1474. He says, consider now, famous kinsman of half Cain. Hrothgar, wise prince, now that I'm eager to depart, gold for the men, what we spoke of before. In other words, he's saying, okay, let's go back over these terms. I'm going to go kill Grendel's mother. If I don't return, everything given to me previously goes to Helax. Why? Because it's Helax. It wasn't given to me. It was given to me to keep in his stead until I could take it to him, right? What does a thane do? A thane goes off and fights in battle. The thane takes whatever is won in battle, gives it to the king. The good king then distributes it back to the thanes, okay? So Beowulf is saying, everything you gave to me, you actually gave to Hrothgar, okay? If I should live, then you can give me more stuff, okay? And if I should die, if anything remains of me, Send that back too. All right? So, he doesn't wait. He does address Unferth. And let Unferth have that ancient heirloom, that well-known man, have my wave pattern sword. He's not talking about the sword that Hrothgar gave him, the sword of Halfdane. He's talking about the sword he brought with him from the land of the gates. All right? So, he gave me hunting, I'll give him my sword. Fair deal. And they were told, he doesn't wish to stay for an answer. He swan dives in. Okay. 
1495. It was the space of a day. No, it wasn't. The Old English reads... How was Queen Dias? That was a time of the day. Literally, that's what that means. That was a time of the day. Okay. The user translates that. It was the space of a day. And then he has a foot, footnote. Or it was daylight. It was daylight before he could perceive the bottom? What? Does that make any sense at all? No, it doesn't. Because, you know, daylight is you close your eyes, you open them, there's daylight. If it's daytime. So what does it really mean? The way most people interpret this is that by a time, and this is from how this word is used in other texts, it was the greater space or time of a day. So what's the greater space or time of a day? More than 12 hours. Okay. It's the greater portion of a day. <coughs> what? Before he could perceive the bottom. So from the time his nose hits the water to the time that he can perceive the bottom of the lake, how much time goes by? 12 hours? Or 12 hours and one second. So what's the poet telling us? So Beowulf's got these huge, massive lungs, you know. <laughs> or, yeah, rip away everything. There's a big, massive ass on his chest, you know. He's not meant to be read as a normal human. He is a 6th century superhero. And I don't understand why scholars have a problem with that. Because you could go back a thousand years, 1500 years actually, before Beowulf, and who's our other superhero? Hercules, Achilles, Agamemnon, Ajax, just start rattling off heroes from the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay? Because things that they do are not things that normal humans could do. And by normal humans, I don't mean, you know, schlubs like me. I don't even mean super heroic warriors like we have in the military. Guys who, you know, fight off 20, 30, 40 people and live. Even those guys are schlubs compared to Beowulf, Hercules, Achilles, etc. Right? So, takes him 12 hours to reach the bottom. And right away, she who held that expanse of water, bloodthirsty and fierce, for a hundred and a half years, okay, she held that expanse of water. She ruled it for how long? No, not 150 years. It's 50 years. It's a hundred and a half years. This is how throughout the poem time is reckoned in half years. Okay? We're going to be told Beowulf will rule for a hundred and a half years when he becomes king. Hrothgar is going to tell us shortly, hopefully today, might be next Tuesday, <laughs> that he's ruled for a hundred and a half years. Actually, he's ruled longer than that. He's going to tell us what happened after he ruled for a hundred and a half years. So, Grendel's mom has been down there a while ruling this lake. And what happens? She perceives that some man was exploring from above that alien land. Now, I don't know what that means. She has super sensitive sensors in the water. So when somebody dives in, it goes beep, 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 beep. <laughs> she, you know, goes searching for him. Or if because of what and who she is, she's immediately aware when somebody invades. But she's aware. And what does she do? She sees them and snatches him and pulls him down. Okay? To her abode, let's say. Line 1503. 
The ring male encircled him so that she could not pierce that war dress, that locked quarter male, with her hostile claws. What kind of claws does she have? What kind of claws did Grindel have? They're described as nails. So, 16 penny nails, about 4 inches long, 8 inches long? Don't know. Long enough to pierce a war corslet if he didn't have such a good one. So what does she do? She's got Beowulf in that she-wolf swims to the bottom and bore the Prince of Rings, the Lord of the Rings, by the way. That's where Tolkien gets his title from. Okay, Into her abode. Or you can actually translate the word that's used for rings, the Lord of the Bagels. It's also the word for ring is the word from which we get bagel. You know, like bagel and locks. Why? Because they're both circles. Okay. Just think if the Lord of the Rings were titled the Lord of the Bagels. How would that be different? National Lampoon. Um, so she takes him down so that he might not wield his weapons, but so many wonders set upon him in the water many a sea beast. So as she's taking him down, all these sea monsters are coming trying to take bites out of him. Okay? And then he suddenly perceives he's in some sort of battle hall. Why? Because what happened? Well, he dives down through the mirror. He comes down, reaches the ground, essentially, and she takes him over here, and over here <clears throat> is an underground cavern, underwater cavern, that has air in it. How do we know it has air in it? What's one of the first things he sees? Where no water can hide you. Okay. And he sees firelight. We'll talk about it in just a moment. So, where no water could harm him in any way, and for the hall's roof he could not be reached by the flood sun rush. And what else? He sees a firelight, a glowing blaze shining brightly. So he goes into her home and sees what? Fire. A nice fire burning on the fireplace. She's a monster for Pete's sake. Why does she need fire? Well, she's also human. So what happens? He saw that water witch, the great mere wife. He gave a mighty blow with his battle sword. He did not temper that stroke. What does that mean, he did not temper that stroke? You ever saw the movie Signs? Mel Gibson, River, uh, Joaquin Phoenix. And what does he have? Is it Joaquin Phoenix? Yeah. What does he, you know, what does Mel Gibson's wife in that movie... Tell Meryl to do. Swing, Meryl. Swing. And what does he finally do at the end? Of he swings that bat with everything he has. That's what Beowulf does with the sword. Okay. Strength of 30 men in each hand. So this is the strength of 60 men swinging his sword. What happens to it? It shatters. Okay. Notice where he tries to swing, by the way. On her head. Why? He's going for a grand slam here. I mean, he just wants to end her in one fell swoop. But the sword doesn't work. Why? Because possibly she has woven around her, as Grindel has about him, spells of protection. Okay? She is going to be killed with a sword. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get to that. So the, the guest discovered then that the battle flame would not bite. Battle flame, kinning for sword, would not bite or wound her. It had endured many hand-to-hand -hand meetings, often sheared through the helmets, faded war garments. Yeah, maybe Unfair's brothers. First time that the fame of that precious treasure had failed. So Beowulf, we're told, was mindful of glory. And what did he do? He threw away the blade so that it lay on the earth. He trusted in his strength, the might of his hand grip, as a man should do if by his warfare he thinks to win long-lasting praise. He cares nothing for his life. It doesn't mean he throws away his life. It just means he's thinking, okay, it's just me now. Me and my hands, I'm going to kill this. The man of the war gates grabbed by the shoulder of Grindel's mother, he had no regret for that feud. And he swings her around so hard that she falls to the ground. 
she quickly gives him requital for that, meaning she throws him to the ground. With a firm grasp and grappled him to her, weary, he stumbled, strongest of warriors, of foot soldiers. Go. Okay, so he's the strongest of warriors. He's the strongest of foot soldiers, infantrymen. So what should he be on his feet? Strong, right? Good. Like Muhammad Ali with his dance, his rope-a-dope. And what happens? He falls. He's just, we've just been told he's the greatest warrior on his feet, and he falls. What? I think that's an example of Anglo-Saxon humor. The poet is setting us up for irony. How ironic. The greatest warrior on his feet trips. Right? How ironic is it? Line 1545. She set upon her hall guest. What does that mean? She set upon. Okay. That is Southern English. Can you say it again, Natalie? She sat. The old English word there isn't set on. Or is it even set? This is the infinitive. It's she set. She. So he falls and she plops down on him. And then she pulls out her little knife and she starts going all, you know, Norman Bates. Eh, 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 on him. Okay. Weary, he stumbled, stronger some warriors. She set upon her all against through her knife, bright, broad edge. She would avenge her boy, her only offspring. On his shoulders lay the link corslet. It defended his life. There the son of Edgedale would have ended his life. Under the wide ground, the Gatus champion had not his battle shirt helped him and holy God. Notice the synergy. Okay. His mail coat is helping him, but so is God. How do we know? And holy God brought about war victory. The wise Lord, ruler of the heavens, Decided it rightly, easily, once he stood up. The word that's translated for once there is the Old English sudden. Okay. And it can be translated variously. He translates it once. It could also be because or therefore. And it's kind of important how you translate it here. Because how you translate it determines the causality. Is he victorious because he stood up? Or is he uh, victorious because the ruler of the heavens decided it rightly? Okay? Which comes first, chicken or the egg? This is kind of the, the question that's being asked here. So, he stands up, and what happens? He sees a sword on the wall. Ancient giant sword, strong in its edges, worthy in battles. It was the best of weapons. Except, greater than any other man might even bear to the play of battle. This is a big sword. I was at a, uh, when I was in London this summer, I went to this collection called the Wallace Collection in London. Massive collection of armors, of armor and weapons and such. And it's got a couple claymores, Scottish swords, that I'm not kidding, are taller than I am. Where the hilt is a foot to a foot and a half long, and the blade's five feet. And a couple of these things have nicks in them, so you can tell. These were really used in battle. you got to be a big man to swing that thing with two hands, okay? This sword is bigger than those. This is a big sword, okay? The work of giants. Notice your gloss tells you, old, highly praised weapons are often called the work of giants. Whether it's meant to connect the sword to the giants who fought against God is not clear, okay? So, Beowulf grabs the sword and draws the ring-marked sword, despairing of his life, struck in fury. Despairing of his life, 
That means he gives it everything he has. And what happens? Chops her head off. Okay? The flames gleam. Now, the way most people read that is she gets killed and the flames suddenly kind of roar up. A light glowed within. He looks around and what does he see? He sees all kinds of stuff. He holds the weapon high. He wishes to pay back Grendel. That is, he wants to find Grendel. He's not sure Grendel might still be alive. So he's going to make sure Grendel's dead. He goes and he finds Grendel. Okay, Line 1584. The fierce champion, for on a couch he saw Grendel lying lifeless. Notice the description. They've got a couch in their house. <laughs> okay, it's not a literal couch. It's on his bed. So even so, Grindel has a bed. They had a fire in the fireplace. They, this is, you know, <laughs> monster decorating 101, as it were. Okay? What the poet is doing here is humanizing Grindel and his mother. Okay? So, he goes over to Grindel's body. And notice, line 1588, his corpse burst open when he was dealt a blow after death. Why? Why did the corpse burst open? Yeah. I mean, you've all seen this. You're driving down the highway, and there's a dead possum. And then you go back a week later, and that dead possum's still there. How does it look now? It's all swollen. Well, you hit, hit that thing with a sword, and what's it going to do? You're going to get possum cuts all over you, man, because it's going to explode. That's what happens, okay? So he chops off Grendel's head. 1591, soon the troops saw it. In other words, meanwhile, back at the top of the mirror, our narrator takes us, and what do they see? The water is welling up now with blood and gore. Is that because this is like, um, oh, what's that one? Miyazaki film. Spirited Away, is that, is that because this is like that one spirit thing in Spirited Away that just keeps vomiting out stuff and Grendel's body is so big? It's just, you know, the ooze is, don't know. But the water's troubled. The gray-bearded elders spoke together about the good one, said they did not expect that nobleman will return. In other words, Another one bites the dust. And they were told, as they leave, that is the day, Hrothgar's men leave. Beowulf's men stay. Line 1600. The ninth hour came. Okay. The ninth hour. The old English is... Uh, was it Thakom non dies. Thakom non dies. Then came the night of the day. No, not nine o'clock at night. Why? That's modern kind of thing. This is biblical time keeping. Or if you want early church time keeping. You have the hours of the day and the day is reckoned into three hour breaks. Okay? Third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, twelfth hour. And each one of those hours in the life of the church, there are services, there are prayers. But it's also biblical. Why? Because it's at the sixth hour that what happens? Christ is nailed on the cross. And it's at the ninth hour that he dies us. Dies us. <laughs> Channeling Gollum, man. Yes, dies us, my precious, you know. Yes, he dies, okay? It's at the ninth hour that he dies. The ninth hour came. What is everybody thinking? Baal's dead. dead, okay? So the poet throws in a clear biblical allusion. It's not a reference. He doesn't say the ninth hour came. Now this suggests Beowulf is Jesus, everybody. That's not what he's doing. Okay? 
right? The noble shieldings abandoned the headland. Home went the gold friend of men. They're thinking he's a goner. Beowulf's men sit sick at heart and stare into the mirror. Probably like, if, if we kind of continue the biblical imagery, John at the foot of the cross. Just staring. Okay. Then the sword, meanwhile, back down at the bottom of the lake, the sword blade starts to melt. It dissolves like dripping molten iron. Okay. Line 16.10. He wields power over times and seasons. That is the true maker. Wields, controls. The man of the gates took no more precious treasures from that place, though he saw many. Then what? He takes the head and the hilt. Okay? So he could probably stick the hilt in his belt. Where's he going to stick the head? Nowhere. So he's got to grab the head and then swim back up. It took half a day to come down. We're not told he hits the water. He's immediately there. He's got to get back up. So he arrives back, line 1623. And the defender of seafarers came to land, swam stout-hearted. He rejoiced in his sea booty, the great bird. His thanes go to thank uh, go toward him. They thank God, rejoice in their prince, that they might see him safe and sound. So he takes off his helmet because he's hot and sweaty. Tells them what happened. And so they march forth. Now, Beowulf carried the head by himself. How many of his men does it take to carry the head? Line 1637. Four of them. Okay. Bear it. On a battle pole. And I think what this means is you have the head and four of the men take their spears and stick the spear head into the underside of the head. So four men carrying this thing. How big is the head? <laughs> Big. Okay. How heavy is the head? 800 pounds? 600 pounds? Each man carries 100 or 150 pounds. So they're, you know, like this. They was like, come on, guys, I carry that thing by myself. Okay? So they come to the hall. And what happens? 1643. Then the ruler of Thanes entered there, daring in actions, honored in fame, battle brave hero to greet Hothgar. Then, where men were drinking, they dragged by its hair Grindel's head across the hall floor. Notice Grindel has hair, first of all. It's not this, you know, bald monster thing. So, what does it mean by they dragged Grindel's head by the hair across the floor? Think what is happening to the floor. You're dragging it by the head. The head's been decapitated, so the soft, fleshy part of the neck is rubbing across the stone flagged floor. This is not nice, smooth marble. So it's, you know, in crud, <coughs> dripping out, okay? Everyone stared at that amazing sight. The bale says, look, <laughs> son of Havdane, we have brought you gladly these gifts from the sea, which you gaze on here, a token of glory. And he says, the battle would have been over at once if God had not guarded me. Notice, Beowulf ascribes glory to God. He says, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have made it. Okay? He looks at Unferth. Sorry, Unferth, your sword's a piece of... <laughs> wouldn't do me any good. Couldn't bring it back, by the way. But it's a good weapon. No, no. The ruler of man granted to me that I might see in the wall a gigantic old sword. Hanging, glittering. So I drew that weapon. He said, I killed her. And I brought Grendel's head. Why? It's proof that she's dead. How does Grendel's head prove that his mom is dead? She wouldn't let him out. Exactly. That's good. Okay. 
So the golden plated hilt or the golden hilt was given to Hrothgar and we're told that it is a 1681, a work of wondersmiths. And when that evil hearted man, Grindel, God's adversary, gave up the world, guilty of murders and his mother too, it passed to the possession of the best of world kings between the two seas. And Hrothgar spoke, but he doesn't. Poet says Hrothgar spoke, and then for about 11 lines, he doesn't speak. For about 11 lines, we get a description of what is on this sword hilt. Where was written the origin of ancient strife? Yeah, and the word there is not written, it's carved. It's in runes, okay? The origin of ancient strife. When the flood slew Russian seas, the race, race of giants. What flood? Is this Noah's flood? Are the race of giants the Nephilim that are referred to in Genesis? Right. The sons of God that went down into the daughters of men and created the race of Nephilim, the sons of God, demonic spirits, impregnating women. Okay. Possible. What else? Also on the sword was written in marked rune letters who the sword had been made for. And we find this all the time. That is, in swords that have been discovered, I don't think these two that I mentioned earlier have this, but there are swords in a variety of museums that have inscribed in runes, Frank had me made, or Inga had me made. Okay? So, now Hrothgar gives his speech, which starts at line 1700, and ends at 1784, okay? about an 84-line speech. This is frequently called one of two things, either Hrothgar's homily or Hrothgar's sermon. Okay. Homily and sermon, both imply what? He's standing up on the soapbox, getting in the pulpit, pulling out his Bible. Okay. This is a moral lesson that he is going to give to Beowulf. And so he says, One may indeed say, if he acts in truth and right for the people, remembers all, that this Earl was born a better man. Better. Better than what? Me? Rothgar? Better than all you other men? Well, that part's clear. Beowulf, my friend, your glory is exalted throughout the world. Notice, he doesn't say, Beowulf, my friend, your glory will be exalted. He says it already is. Why? Well, because he's already heard stories about Beowulf's strength. You're over every people. You hold it all with patient care and temper strength with wisdom. You hold it all. What's the it? His glory. What's he saying about Beowulf and glory? He knows how to handle it. If we were to bring in, I will go there. Uh, yeah. What is Beowulf not? He's not a boaster. Though he does boast. What's another way of putting it? He's not conceited. He's not full of himself. In other words, when he boasts, is it really a boast? He can do it. When Usain Bolt says, I'm the fastest man in the world, is that a boast? No, find someone faster. Just find someone faster. You do that, and then he's not the fastest man in the world anymore. Okay? So... Rothgar says, you hold it all with patient care. You do what? You temper strength with wisdom. Why does he, what does he mean by temper? What do you do when you temper something? Like steel. Yeah, you treat it. Okay. You mix it with something to do what? To make it stronger. Okay. So what's he doing? He's tempering strength, to use a Latin word, 
fortitudo with what? Wisdom. Sapientiae. Okay? He says, you do what? You mix these two things and make something stronger out of To you I shall fulfill my friendship, as we have said. You shall become a comfort everlasting to your own people and a help to heroes. Not so was Haramod. This is the second time we've heard Haramod's name referred to. You will be a comfort and help to your people. Haramod wasn't. He was bad. Okay? So he goes on and talks about how bad he was. He, 1713, enraged cut down his table companions. He slew the men eating at his own table. Duty to Lord, duty to Ken, duty to avenge Lord and Ken. Okay, the duty to ten, Ken part, that's, you don't kill people eating at your own table. Until he turned away alone from the pleasures of men. The mighty God exalted him in the joys of strength and force, advanced him far over all men. Yet in his heart he nursed a blood ravenous breastguard. Notice what Hrothgar is saying. God exalted him. And what did Haramo do? Does he thank God? No. What does he assume? I did it. I did it myself. No rings did he give to the Danes for their honor. Oh. What do good kings do? Distribute treasure. He doesn't. So, mark of a good king? Distribute treasure. Mark of a bad king? Hoard treasure. He endured joyless to suffer the pains of that strife, a long-lasting harm to his people. He says, I'm telling you this why. In the wisdom, let me back up, learn from him. Understand virtue. I'm telling you this in the wisdom of my winters. We don't know how many winters this is yet. He's going to tell us. It is a wonder to say how mighty God in his great spirit allots wisdom, land, and lordship to mankind. He has control of everything. How many times is the poet going to tell us that? Whether through the poet's own voice or through one of the characters in the poem. Multiple times. At times, he permits the thoughts of a man in a mighty race to move in delights. That is, to have delightful thoughts, to have thoughts that will bring him delight. Such as, for example, gives him to hold in his homeland the sweet joys of earth, a stronghold of men. Grants him such power over his portion of the world, a great kingdom, that he himself cannot imagine an end to it in his folly. In other words, God allows someone to become a king, to become a powerful king, and to become such a powerful king that he himself cannot imagine an end to it. The king thinks, because he's ruled powerfully and for long, it'll never end. Notice, in his folly. Why? What did Beowulf say to Hrothgar about Asher? And not just Asherah, but all of us. We all die. He dwells in plenty. That is, this imaginary king dwells in plenty. He has everything he needs. In no way plague him illness or old age, nor do evil thoughts darken his spirit, nor any strife or sword. Hate shows itself. All the world turns to his will. This guy is at the top of Fortune's Wheel. I drew Fortune's Wheel up here the other day. Everything is going for him. Nobody challenges him. Everybody's afraid of him. Does this sound like anybody we've met so far in the poem? Shield Cheving becomes so feared that people far and near pay tribute to him. And then one other one. Rothgar. Right? At last, his portion of pride within him grows and flourishes. His portion. What does that mean? The bit of pride 
dealt to him. Okay? Does what? Grows and flourishes. Notice, that bit of pride is fine. If it stays what it is at its origin, if it stays what it is when it's given to him. But now it grows and flourishes. While the guardian sleeps, what's the guardian? The soul's shepherd. The literal word is the soul's warden. What is the soul's shepherd? What is the guardian of the soul? What tells you not to do something? Your conscience. Though, the Anglo-Saxons had no word for conscience. And based upon the text that we have, especially the homiletic text, they don't have even an understanding of that word. Okay? But they do have this notion of something guarding the soul. What happens? The conscience sleeps, and that sleep is too sound. Bound with cares, the slayer too close, who sinful and wicked shoots from his bow. Notice, your gloss says the slayer is sin or vice. The soul's guardian is reason, conscience, or prudence. Okay. Well, what does the slayer shoot from his bow? A bitter dart. But the word that's used for bitter there can also mean fiery or flaming dart. And if it means that, then what we have here is an allusion to St. Paul's book of Ephesians, which talks about in chapters 5 and 6, I think it is, putting on the full armor of God. Why? You put on the breastplate of righteousness to do what? To put out the fiery darts that the wicked one shoots at you. Okay? We have here fiery darts <clears throat> being shot. Okay? He knows no defense. The strange, dark demands of evil spirits. What he has long held seems too little. Meaning, I have this much. It's not enough. Now I want this much. And then I want this much. And then I want the whole world. Angry and greedy, he gives no golden rings for vaunting boasts. And his final destiny, he neglects and forgets. What's his final destiny? What is everybody's final destiny? Death. Okay? He forgets and neglects that he will die. Okay? What does he mean by neglect? Ignores. So, he doesn't do what? doesn't prepare until it finally comes about that the lone life dwelling starts to decay and falls fated to die another follows him his son who what? doles out his riches without regret the earl's ancient treasure he heeds no terror that takes us back to the prologue what were we told in the prologue? very early in the poem. Thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions so that later in life loyal comrades will stand beside him when war comes. It's line 21. Okay? He dies and his son does what? Distributes treasure without regret. Defend yourself from wickedness, Beowulf, he says. Best of men. Choose better eternal counsel. There is no idea in Germanic mythology and pagan Germanic belief system of eternal counsel. Okay? Care not for pride. What's he telling Beowulf? It's Han Solo to Luke. Don't get cocky, kid. That's exactly what he means. Don't think that because you've, because you've killed a bunch of monsters, that you're always going to be a monster killer. Don't think because you're strong and wise now that you are always going to be strong and wise. Why? The glory of your might is but a little while. And too soon, you 
sure Bill and I can attest to this. It will be sickness or the sword will shatter your strength of the grip of fire or the surging flood or the cut of a sword or the flight of a spear. Notice what he puts at the end. Or terrible old age. And your eyes will flail, fail and flicker out. You're going to die. How are you going to die? Okay? It might be sickness, it might be a sword, it might be the grip of fire, it might be a surging flood, it might be the cut of a sword, or the flight of a spear, or, worst of all, you just get it old, your teeth fall out, your arms hurt. Right? Thus, what does thus mean? Okay, keep going, but what does it imply? What is its relation to everything that's come before? Thus, a hundred half years, I held the ring dance under the skies. Thus, like the man I just described, I held the ring dance for 50 years. Is he saying, I was the guy I was just talking about? Okay. And kept them safe from war from many tribes throughout this Middle Earth, from spears and swords, so that I considered none under the expanse of heaven my enemy. That's exactly what he was saying before about that imaginary ruler. And then look, turnabout came in my own homeland, grief after gladness, when Grindel became my invader. When did Grindel come? No, not at the beginning. After 50 years. He's saying, I ruled for 50 years. 50 years of what? Peace and prosperity. Everyone was afraid of me. And then Grindel shows up. So Grindel shows up. How long does Grindel rule? So we're talking 62 years. How long, how old was Hrothgar when he became king? Wild guess. We were not told. Minimum, minimum, I would say, 18. Makes him 80 years old at this point. Is there a reason why he doesn't pick up his sword and go kill Grindel himself? He probably can't pick up the damn thing. Okay. And if he's older than 18, remember, he had two of older brothers. Okay. If he's 30... It puts me 92. Okay. For that persecution I bore perpetually the greatest heart cares. Thank you, Jesus, <laughs> that I have lived long enough to see that head stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. Go to your seat, enjoy the feast, honored in battle. You're going to get a lot of loot. <laughs> okay. Strength and wisdom? What does Hrothgar have? Tons of wisdom. Earned over 62 years of reign. Okay? He's kind of lacking in this at this point. But back before this, or in the first 50 years, yeah, he had strength then, but he'd been reigning for 50 years when Grindel came. He was probably already, when Grindel came, pretty old. If he was 18 when Grindel came, yeah, then he was 68 when Grindel came. Now I know you can have strong 68-year-olds. Look at Schwarzenegger. Look at Stallone. But Hrothgar wasn't pumping iron. Okay, there's a, they were taking steroids either. Okay, there's a huge difference. So, what's he? What's the purpose of this little speech? He's saying. Beowulf, learn from my example. Don't be a damn fool like I was. Okay? We'll stop there, and probably next time we'll see whether or not Beowulf does become a damn fool. We're still one day behind, so more than likely the exam will be the 29th, unless we get more behind, which is always likely.